Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we, do, we deliver HR to companies with 49 or fewer people with our HR platform and, pro, and providing you with a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Carrie Stewart. Carrie, are you ready to be great today? Yes. Carrie is a Gulf War, Gulf War veteran who spent eight years in the Air Force. He has a Bachelor of Science in Business Management is a 500 hour registered yoga teacher with Yoga Alliance and has been retired since 2014. Suffering from chronic pain and PTSD since his military days, Carrie understands firsthand the numerous benefits of yoga and meditation for pain reduction and mental clarity. Carrie, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So, Carrie, um, I'm gonna go way back in the day on, 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 your, on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> you, you were actually a manager at a CC's Pizza. Yes, sir. That had to be an experience. <laughs> I, I can't ever imagine, like, like back in then, like, pizza, all you eat, 99 cent buffet, people bring the whole families in. Like, it was just, I remember, like, CCP just being madness. So, can you tell yeah. me that experience, some? Yeah, we would feed about uh, 2,000 people a week. And yeah, it was insane because when I first started, it was 299 buffet. And I actually started that journey in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And so you would have, you know, all the people that would come in and the families and just all walks of life, you know, especially in a, in a tourist place like that. Uh, you know, you, you'd have the girls coming in in their bikinis and we'd, we'd ask them if they could put on some shirts or shorts or things like that. They just got off the beach and they're ready to come in and just, you know, eat pizza and things like that. And, uh, you know, we'd have lines out the door. And so we'd have to send somebody cut up pizza smaller or garlic bread and hey go feed this line make them a little bit happy until they could come in and get a seat you know so it was uh i would say transitioning from a manager into an owner a franchisee was one of the biggest learning experiences that i've ever had in my life yeah i think there's nothing worse than a customer ccp so it goes up to get some pizza there's nothing there <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's uh that's definitely a challenge and sometimes well kansas city that that would happen we would have like big groups of band or church groups or something just pull in the parking lot not call us not warn us you know and you have 100 people walking in and and it's like oh my gosh it's going to be about 15 20 minutes before we catch up guys so and so you had to run the whole do like electricity like everything was on, on you right yeah, yeah. Franchisee, uh, you definitely are responsible for the lease. You're responsible for, you know, A to Z within that restaurant. So, you know, when when labor prices go up or minimum wage goes up, you've got to go through and calculate what is it I can, you know, raise my prices because I still got to pay these employees, you know, and, and how many customers am I going to lose over this? And I would say on average, when you increase minimum wage, it's about a 20% when you increase your prices of the people you're going to lose. You'll lose about 20% of your customers when you increase your price overall. So, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, like all the minimum wage have gone down to $15 an hour with the case would be like, whether they deserve that or not, that's a different, different conversation, but still right. like you have to pass the costs on, right? And what's that mm -hmm. cutoff point with the same wall? I'll pay like $3.50 for a hamburger, fries, or whatever, but I'm not paying $5, right? Everyone has a cutoff right. point based on economics. And I don't think, I don't think a lot of people realize, realize that. Now, and the taxes that go into that and the insurance and unemployment insurance and all those other, and you have so many fixed costs. So when I ran the restaurant, you know, my gas bill was over $800 a month, you know, and plus my, all, all the other fixed costs. So your rent costs are fixed. Your gas costs is pretty much the same. Electric costs, all those fixed costs that you have. So, you know, none of that is, is going to go down <laughs> every year. Everything always increases more and more. So it's, and it's, I'm it's, guessing you can't say, "Hey, hey, customers, I'm gonna turn off half the lights." So I'm say my light bill, right? That fire will go too well. <laughs> right. So, like, you know, in the afternoon, we would go down to instead of having three ovens, we'd go down to one oven to help save a little bit on the gas. But you know, it's just uh, there's so many costs that people don't even understand that are associated with a business. Um, you know, like when there's a food, food food shortage, so like tomatoes or cucumbers or lettuce or whatever it may be. You know, there's a shortage of that, then we're struggling, and or sometimes we have to pay more for just you know our produce and things like that. So our fuel prices, when fuel prices go up, everything in the restaurant has to be delivered, and you know all of our costs go up. I mean, I've been guilty of this before, like going like we'll say like Kentucky, Kentucky Fried Chicken to the drive-through, and yeah. like we're out we're out of chicken today. Like not you know, of course you know, I think like how's that possible? 
you're like, but well, you don't understand, like, like you said, all the stuff going on, you know, the food, mm-hmm. everything, you know, like, how you got a chicken? It's literally yeah. in your name of your business, right? <laughs> but you know, like, it's, it's, it's different times now, right? It's, it's crazy. It is. It is. So was that your first time being like an entrepreneur? Yeah, it was. It was, um, it was, I would say a mixed bag. I learned so many things about labor, so much about people, so much about running a business, uh, you know, each and every day is a new experience. And what people don't realize is I would say every week, something major happens in, in a CC's pizza, you know, either a, your deep freeze will go out or something with the water or, you know, I, I mean, one day I had a toilet break, like the whole toilet, you know, or uh, we had a kind of an L-shaped restaurant in the back and this family got up to eat and they're like, you need to go check in the back. you got a water leak. I'm like, what? And I walk around there and it was like a six top table. Mm. And I look up and the HVAC had fall through the ceiling and the vent was like on the table. And so one of the air conditioners, I think I had six of them or something, <laughs> that water got condensed in there, pressured up, and then it backfilled into the the vents and filled up and then it just collapsed. So it was just things like that every single week. I wish I would have kept a diary and a log of everything that happened because <laughs> the craziest things you never even thought would imagine happen, happen in a restaurant. And, uh, you know, you have a, you have a whole list of people on call that A, B, and C, because you just never know who you're going to need at any time. So when you left, how did it work? Like, did you sell your steak to someone else or CC took the franchise back or they went out of business? What happened with uh, that? So that's a whole, that is one crazy, bizarre story. And we can dive into a little bit of that. So I, I was a, a general manager and then the VA said, Hey, we'll pay for your book, school and tuition. Uh, if you want to go to school. And at the same time, my, my grandmother had died in Oklahoma and I went back and I was in Kansas city. And before that I was in Florida and I saw the cost of living in Oklahoma. And my wife and I had some really in-depth conversations and we said you know what we can go to Oklahoma we can sell this old house that was built in the 60s in Kansas City and buy a brand new house for the same price in Oklahoma (laughs) so we loaded up relocated down there I was three years into school I had one semester left and I said I got to finish this semester because both my mom and dad did the same thing they had one semester left of college and never finished and they always said that was one of their biggest regrets ever um, but my buddy that owned the CCs said, I want out of the store completely. I want to go back to my ranch in Texas. You can just have the store. I'm not going to charge you anything for it. We're great friends. I know you'll take care of it. You know, there's still a lease on this, on this property. So immediately I came in, I took over, I, uh, said, Hey, in about six months, 12 months at the most, I'll be back in school. And, uh, I get into the store and then CC's is like, well, you've been out for more than 18 months. So you need a business partner. So they gave me a business partner, this guy named Hal, and he was doing really well as the books go. And so me and him became a partnership, but he goes, I really just want to be a silent partner. I don't want to really, you know, you know, everything you're doing, you've done very well, very successful. Uh, you can buy me out in like a year. And so I'm like, all right, so I get the store up and running and get things going. And then he changes his contract because the contract we had was just verbal. It wasn't actually ever a written agreement. And then he goes in and uh, behind my back somehow changes the agreement with CC. So your operating agreement and your franchise agreement are supposed to be the same. Well, the franchise agreement with CC, he changed it to where he was like 85% owner and I was 15% owner. Uh, And so, you know, there's some discussions and some arguments and some things that are occurring. Uh, Meanwhile, this guy was just doing a lot of things that were crooked and uh, he was being deceitful on a lot of things. And so what really drew it for me is that there was a shooting out in the parking lot. Two of the rival high schools right there had a shooting. There's an IHOP and a 54th Street Bar and Grill. And I have family members coming to pick up their kids and bullets are going over their heads and their cars and there's bullet holes all in the awning. And I just said, and I lost all that staff. All the staff that went through that gunfight that night basically did not want to come back into that environment. And I I don't blame them. I mean, who would, right? And especially kids, you know? Um, And so from that point on, I told him, I said, I need out of this restaurant. I, I want to get out. I want to move on. I, I just, I can't do this anymore. You know, this hasn't been a good business relationship with us. You know, it's impossible for me now to want to buy you out. 
And so I said, hey, I'm turning my resignation. I'll give you 30 days to find somebody. And he's like, oh, can you give me more time? Give me more time. And I was busy, you know, but I was still making income. So I said, I'm fine. So finally, I said, hey, December 31st, I'm gone. I'm locking the doors to this place and I'm out of here. And he said, okay, fine. And so, you know, just like everything else with him, I could never get him to sign on the dotted line or go through an agreement. And uh, I went I went to go work for a utility company. Ironically, I was doing IT and they pull us into a conference room a week later and, and said, you can't leave this room. You have to turn off your cell phone, no communication. The owner of the company comes in, it was a privately owned. He said, hey, I'm selling the company. We're announcing it in 30 minutes. You guys have to stay here until the announcement. I'm like, man, I haven't got a paycheck yet. <laughs> <laughs> the place I'm working for is, is closing down. Uh, and then after that, I went to go work for the IRS. Well, then he filed a lawsuit against me and then he didn't, he hadn't paid taxes. He didn't pay any of the taxes. We were using the same accountant. The accountant had access to everything. And so since he didn't transfer anything in my name, I was still liable for it. Um, and actually there was warrants out for my arrest because he had done things illegal in the store and never transferred my name over. Uh, so it's a very long, crazy story. But yeah, that's a very bad experience you had. It was, it was. And so we had to end up paying $75,000 in back taxes uh, for a certain time period. I mean, I even went to the IRS. I gave them my uh, resumes. All, you know, they have all my tax forms, but we had to sit down with like a, a, a kind of a counselor lady. And I just said, you know, this is horrible. You know, and, and she goes, yeah, this is very unfortunate. You have to go through this, but this is the law. Um, but what's uh, an even twist to the story is that he befriended like a 16-year-old a girl that was a registered girl at one of his stores, moved him in, and they were doing all kinds of crazy things. And she ended up uh, murdering him. Oh, um, wow. That's, a, yeah. that's definitely a twist on the story. Yeah. And I mean, we had to file bankruptcy personally twice. Um, and, and it was a benefit, I would say, in the long run, because we had to pay cash for our kids' school, cash for cars, cash for our houses. You know, so we walked away with that with no debt. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, you know, we had to file twice because every time we get close to not having bankruptcy, he would come out with another personal lawsuit, um, put liens on our, our, our properties, all kinds of stuff. So I learned a lot that probably a lot of people never get to experience or learn through a business um, interaction. So, you know, I, I encourage people that if you're going to go in business with somebody, probably don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you definitely, everyone always talks about, you know, all the, all the great stuff about business, like, you know, being a millionaire mm -hmm. in six weeks, all the case may be living your life. You've right. you definitely seen the other, the darker side, so to speak. Yeah. I would say that most people don't own the business. The business owns them. And, and it's unfortunate that, you know, they're tied up so much mentally, physically, and spiritually and engulfed into that, in, into that business that a lot of times their relationships begin to struggle, you know, and I, I could say that during, there was times during that, that my relationships, you know, with my kids, my wife, my friends definitely struggled because I devoted so much time, energy, and effort into making a successful business. And it was, I mean, we were number one in sales for Coke. We won this Coke, um, you know, promotion, our sales increased over 20% every year. So it was just, you know, it was one of those things is I, you know, uh, you have to take accountability from day one, whatever it is in your relationships, personally and professionally, wherever you're at in your life, but you have to take accountability and say, what is it I can do to, you know, make this business as best as possible. And you can't play the role of a victim. I can't say that the people before, this is the situation that I'm, that I'm in now. No, today is the day that you start. You know, and I and I took that belief every single day and every single day I did, you know, what I call guerrilla marketing and went out into the community and marketed that business. And I, I know that's one reason why it was so successful. So besides not taking on this new partner, any other lessons and or advice you can pass on? I mean, for me, when, one thing that I did was I I give evaluations, you know, or feedback to my employees annually. But what I did was I would pick one person out of each position. So like a bus disher or maybe the prepper, you know, my register person or the cook or whoever it is. And I would have them say, hey, here's the thing is a week from today, you're going to give me an evaluation. I want you to sit down with me and give me the feedback. And this isn't going to affect your job. This isn't going to affect anything like that. But I just need to know where I'm going to grow 
and flourish. And, and I think that goes back to like emotional intelligence, but also humility, that no matter what position that you're in, that you're willing to take feedback and understand who you are and their perception of you. Because so many times in our life, our ego gets in the way, you know, and we feel like we're entitled or we're better and we don't value other people's, you know, perception of us. And it's very important that the person washing the dishes or prepping the food or serving the food or whatever it is knows, you know, I understand their perception of me and what guests see, you know, because people are going to talk. And so I think that's what's one of the things that I learned the most was just being humble, you know? I think one thing too, like, you know, that person washes the dishes, like, a lot of people look down on them. You're, you know, this the mm-hmm. low minimum wage worker, but you don't know what his dreams are. Like they might be doing that to, like, to pay themselves through college, or you never know what case may be, right? You never know what, what other people's stories are. Yeah, I had a I had a cook that was from Mexico. She saved up all her money and moved back to um, oh my gosh, it's one of the places in the coast where everybody does. I, I, I'm I have brain fog half the time, but it's one of those beautiful places that people go to resort in. And she opened up a pizza restaurant. She took the menus, the recipes, she took everything. <laughs> and she saved her money for all those years that she worked there. And that's it, man. I mean, who would never thought making $8 an hour at a pizza restaurant in Grandview, Missouri could get you an amazing restaurant in Mexico in a tourist place, you know? So you're right. So this kind of reminds me of a post I did a couple of days on LinkedIn. I, I did a quest on LinkedIn. I said like, why is it so many people think they're special or talented? but they're really not actually nowhere close to being that, but they think they are and they act like it. And so many people actually tell them they're special. They think they're average, like just seems like a disconnect, mm. right? Like, why is that? Yeah, I think a lot of times, well, I go back to saying that your gifts and talents are unique and you don't have to have a conventional life to be happy. So she probably learned, she probably took a lot of notes every day and went home and, and understood about what it was to run a business. But I think a lot of times is, we're in a, a very unique society where people don't want to give true feedback, right? And, and failure is feedback. When you fall, you're going to learn, right? And I think a lot of times people don't want to think that providing optimistic or realistic feedback is positive when it really is. You know, these are the areas in our life that I need to improve in and you need to improve in. I, I think that's one reason why I don't have a lot of friends and the friends that I've had, I've had probably for years, years is because um, my wife says that I hold people to a certain standard, a certain caliber. And what that's allowed me to do is have healthy boundaries, but also not to have a lot of drama in my life, a lot of chaos, because I don't want those people in my life. It's not healthy for me, you know? Yeah. yeah I'm a big believer the higher standards is actually a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So next, talk about your volunteer experience. I believe it's a World War, World yeah. War One Museum in Kansas City. And the art museum. So I was, I have to back step that just a little bit, but I was, uh, I was doing cybersecurity for the USDA and I was coming home and I'd get on the couch. We had a two-story house and uh, I couldn't get off the couch. I mean, I, for me to go outside, I had to pee out the back door and stuff. And, and the weekends, like if my wife wanted me to go to Target or go shopping so many times, I would just collapse or sat down on the aisle you know and I'm just like I can't walk I can't move like I was in a lot of pain mentally physically and spiritually and I didn't understand what was going on and my wife said this isn't what I signed up for which I thought it meant she wanted a divorce but really what she was saying is like you need to focus on your health and well-being you need to retire you need to just you know you're spending too much time energy and effort for that career that job and there's nothing left for me. There's nothing left for the family. And we only have one life to live. So I retired and focused on my health. And so the first thing I did was um, I went out to New Jersey for golf war testing. And they uh, spent a week out there. And it was it, it was kind of depressing in a sense, because I think at that point, I was maybe 15 or 20 percent disabled. I was medically discharged. But they said, you know, there's 300,000 or 330, something like that, thousand people with the same kind of conditions I had. And uh, their belief system was it's from immunizations and exposure to the Gulf War. And so I decided to retire. And when I did, I said, I need to connect with the community at some point in some level. So I really love the military, the structure. I love the service. I love how people are willing to truly give their life to make our lives better. 
and I love the arts and inter entertainment. So I volunteered for two places, once a week at the War Memorial and the Nelson Art Museum. So I could kind of satisfy both of those desires, you know, and those ability to connect. So the World War Museum in Kansas City, if you guys ever go to Kansas City, I highly, highly recommend it. It's an amazing, amazing experience. The people there are highly trained and they care. You know, they care about the community. Most of the volunteers are military, ex-military. And, and how long do you, are you still volunteering those two places? No, I'm not there anymore. Uh, I've been in Colorado for three years. Okay. And then I, I quit volunteering. So it's probably been about three and a half, four years I haven't volunteered at those places. And then you also spent some time as a freelance photographer, right? Doing that as yeah. a business? Yeah, I did. And that was... Uh, you know, that was a form for me to give back. I, I got a lot of negative feedback from a lot of uh, people because once again, it was an opportunity for me to connect. And I know in Kansas City in higher populated areas, there's a lot of people that can't afford photography, right? Um, so at, at first I started off just charging like 25 or $50 per hour. And all these photographers are so mad at me, so furious. And they're like, you, you know, you're underbidding us, you're costing us business. Um, I mean, I said, it's, okay. it's called free market, right? It is. So I changed my format. And what I decided to do was I didn't charge at all. I had suggested amounts that you contribute to a nonprofit on my behalf. So that I was like, hey, if you're upset that I'm charging, that's fine. Then I'm just not going to charge anything because now I feel like I'm doing a service. You know, I would charge for the, the photos. There was an online, you know, format. So if you wanted to order photos online, line, I would still make money that way. But for me to actually go out and photograph and do the edits and everything, all that, I just asked that you made a contribution to uh, any, your favorite nonprofit on my behalf. And it was a really, really great opportunity for me to kind of give back to the community and others give back to the community um, and expand. And I actually got a lot more business that way than I did when I was charging. <laughs> so what are you doing, just headshots or like... Uh, weddings or what kind of photography I did, were you doing? Yeah, I did weddings. I did a lot of fitness models. Um, There's a lot of fitness in Kansas City. So somehow I got into that realm and the friends would refer the friends. So I, I did a lot of fitness models. I did a lot of weddings and a lot of seniors, headshots and a lot of businesses. So if it's a real estate office or something like that, I would go and do headshots for those organizations. And then um, like, um, oh, what's that called? Like, you know, when bars you know like a coyote ugly where they have a whole thing of bars or women in, in different outfits i would do stuff like that for a lot of the bars as well and this all pretty much word of mouth you had a, a marketing plan mm -hmm. or something no it started off word of mouth and then i did a, a group on and then i canceled the group on but it, after you get into like one realm you know once you when you when you do one or two people in the fitness industry or you do one or two weddings then you know you're and that's the thing is I only scheduled one photo session a week. That was it because I was still volunteering. I still had other things. I wasn't going to overextend. Um, and so if, you know, the time and, and everything schedule worked out with those people, then it worked out. If otherwise it didn't, but I only did one session a week. Yeah. I have someone here in the Seattle area. He's a photographer and, and he started out doing wedding stuff and he's trying to get out of weddings and do like different things. But every time the money calls him, right? Like the money oh, yeah. calls him, right? <laughs> Because he wants to do like more nature stuff, no different yeah. those things, you know, like other, but that, that wedding stuff keeps calling back. Every time he says he's not going to do it anymore, someone says, here's, I'll give you this much money. And like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, for the money, you make a lot. And then if you can sell your photos as a package, then you're going to make even more. So it's, uh, it's definitely advantageous. But to me, it was just an opportunity to connect. And it was just, it was like a real true side hustle. I mean, you know, the money that I made before I started asking for it, or even from photo sales. It paid for all my gear and all my equipment. Everything was paid for, you know? So it's kind of like, oh, I get a hobby and then I have a little bit of extra money and everything's going to be paid for for this hobby as well. So, yeah. So we're going to talk about yoga in a minute, but with you doing the, you know, the volunteer at the two museums, the photography, yoga, do you still consider yourself like a creative? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think we're all creative. I think it's just finding those, the opportunity within us those energy or the, those, those juices, if however you want to say it, but we're all creative. Our, all of us have unique gifts and talents. And I think sharing that with the community at some facet and some level is just such a wonderful experience. 
when did it pop in your mind? When did the light bulb go off in your head? Like, you know, like you're a creative. When did you realize that? I don't know. I mean, I had a camera probably middle school, an old Canon AE-1. I don't know if, if you're into photographer, uh, photography at all, but I had an old film and I remember taking photos with that thing. And then I would go develop it and you get a, get it back like a week later and like one or two photos would, would come out good. <laughs> so it was back in the old days. Like if you, if you did a whole roll of film and one or two came out good, it was good. So I think it's kind of like, once again, it's the feedback, right? Like I would take photos of nature and people and just post them up and people are like, well, your photography, your photography just really inspires me. You have just such a unique eye and, and concept of, and so, you know, it doesn't serve everybody, but I would get a lot, a lot of feedback. And so well, I said, let me try this photography thing as a side hustle, you know, uh, let me see what that's like. And so that's kind of how all the things in my life and journey, I mean, I just really blessed, you know, I did elect electronic warfare in the air force. And then when I got out and, and did cybersecurity, I was never formally trained in cybersecurity. I taught myself everything, you know, um, I didn't go and finish up my degree until I was almost done with CCs. So a lot of it was real life experiences. I had the foundations for three years in there, but you know, all those things that I went through in CCs, I didn't learn in college. I think college is very valuable. I will say that there's things that I learned in college that I utilize each and every day of my life. And a lot of times we don't realize that, but I would say a college education, if you can get it and afford it and pay for it, I don't think anybody should go in debt for college. But I think if you can get into that realm of, of little or no debt, it's going to be valuable tools and lessons and, and life experiences that you'll use each and every day. I think a lot of people get wrong about college and it's going to be wrong. Like it, it's overpriced, you know, like I think that stat show the price has increased by a thousand percent since the seventies, but you know, salaries are increased by 5%. So, you know, all that too. But I think people forget it's not the schooling, it's like the people you meet, the networking, right? So I remember hearing a, st yeah, I remember hearing a story somewhere where this guy, I was talking about the show about his son in North Carolina. I think he was going to Duke. And the son said, hey, dad, I'm not making it. You know, I'm making D's and C's. You know, I'm wasting your money. Let me go to another school. And he's, and he's talking about his roommate. His roommate is crushing right? His roommate's doing this, doing that. He said, son, the reason I'm paying for you is so you can meet people like your roommate. So you're going to stay at Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think people yeah. miss that a lot. The social aspect, you know. Yeah. The, well, the connection. And you think most of the time, you know, it's a common bond. You know, we have a common connection. There's something that brought us there together to this community to connect and whatever you decide to do with it, you know, from that point forward, a lot of people are just miserable, right? Or struggling. A lot of people that they see this as short term, but you're right. It's, it's truly is about connections and everything that we do. And, and that's part of the thing is, you know, when, when I lead retreats and, and I talk to anybody that I feel so little down or depressed or suicidal, I just, I tell them, I said, you don't know your future connections. You don't know who you're going to meet tomorrow, next week, or next year that's going to really just make this huge impact, or you're going to make an impact in their life, you know, so. Yeah, it connects us are random. Like, I remember I was eating a lunch at a, at a, at a restaurant here in the, in the Pike Place Market, and I just talked to this, this lady and her son, right? They came to visit Seattle, I think, from somewhere, I think, uh, somewhere in Iowa, Iowa, just come to make a random trip, and just talked like 30 minutes, right? It was like, it was so pleasant and so, you know, invigorating, mm -hmm. right? You just never know. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, it's just opening ourselves up to those connections, opening ourselves up and not blocking. The, the problem is a lot of us live in fear, anxiety, doubt, guilt and shame. And we're blocking. And the thing is, you know, you, you can't numb or block certain emotions. If you're blocking any of those emotions, you're blocking the joy, the peace, the serenity, the love, the forgiveness. So, you know, we, we, we can't selectively numb are, are, you know, any of those no emotions. We're do it all, so. So, Kerry, so you, you say everyone's a creative, but I'll say I'm probably less creative, creative than most people, right? <laughs> so what I've tried to do, I try, I, I'm really intentional. I try to surround myself creative. Like when I, when I hire for the company, I try to hire creators, right? Because right. I, I, I think creators think differently. Can you talk to, to, about the advantage of how cre creatives have a different mindset, how they approach things differently? Yeah, I would say that it's not, it's a, it's a concept of thinking almost as beautiful and elegant an array of different colors, insights, and emotions. Also kind of being more observant. And I, I would say for me, it's being in the moment. 
you know, not really thinking about the past or the future. But as I look out my window right now and I see the blue skies and I see the evergreens and, and the pines and I see the snow and I see the rock formations, I can see all the different shadows and contrasts. And so it's just like when I look at you and I see the gray and the black and the different in the beard and how the hair, you know, everything that I look at you, I kind of would describe it as, hey, how does this, how does this person look? How does that mic stand? How's the computer? Everything like that. So I think part of it is being very observant. I think a part of it is being in the moment. And I would think also is seeing the beauty, seeing the positive in life and not focusing on the negative, but how can I, how can I share this experience? If you think about photography as an example, all I'm doing is capturing that precise second, that moment in time. That's all I'm doing is capturing this moment. You know, it used to be on film, but now it's through digital, right? And so how can you capture this precise moment and how can you attach yourself to the thoughts, feelings and emotions within this precise moment and being in this moment? not focusing on the past or not focusing on the future. And a lot of that goes into mindfulness, meditation and yoga. So I think creatives also, I wouldn't say are the worst critics, but I would say that they also expect more out of themselves. You know, they, they want to be able to express and share love, joy, peace, but they also want to share the pain, the guilt and the shame, but it's just not always the, their primary focus. You know, they, they want to say, how can I share some of the beautiful things in this life? How can I share some of the trauma and the tra tragic events as history goes on? Because I want people to understand what this moment was like, you know, and so go ahead. I, I think you like the example. So a couple of years ago, I have set up a tech event, right? And nobody was helping out with the, you know, speakers, whatever. And my intern, Noah Thomas, shout out to Noah Thomas. He's a, a creator of the capital C. So the event had ended, it was like six of us in the elevator, right? Maybe, maybe actually eight, six, eight of us in the elevator, pre-COVID, of course. And he says, look up. Like, man, we're not looking, what are you talking about? He said, man, just look up. We looked up and it was like a mirror on the ceiling. He took the picture. It had to be the best picture we've ever seen, right? I mean, it caught right. us all in the mirrors, like, and none of us ever thought to look up and take a picture, right? But yeah. he did, like you said, seeing the creator, everything. And that picture, like, it, it would viral went everywhere, right? It was just, just amazing. Yeah, I think it's a different perspective. You know, and it's I'm not saying that other people's perspective is right or wrong. It's different. And a lot of times, if you can capture that, edit it and enhance it, then you're to the point where, you know, to me, this is beautiful. This is impactful. You know, like Dorothy Lane, some of the photos that she took during the Depression, you know, are some of the most impactful photos because she toured around, you know, during those times and during the Dust Bowl and captured those moments of those people that were really struggling and suffering. We've seen a lot of that through the Vietnam War and Korean War. You know, people that captured that, those moments, and without the photography or without those people being there, you know, you really get an unbiased, I would say, emotional attachment because you are looking at those people's eyes and you're feeling it, right? Unlike the media today that has to have a spin or a different agenda, you know, to it, you're getting the raw, authentic, real person back in those days. Hey, so how close are you to all the, all the fires that just happened in Colorado? Are you close by that? That's kind of far away. Yeah, I'm close. So we go for a, a hike south of here. And what was that? Two weeks ago, we're, we, we go on a sunset one every evening. And to the north, the, the whole sky was just covered with, with the clouds. And then to the west was a snowstorm that was coming in the day after. And uh, it was so windy, though, that day. Like... We've had, I mean, I think it was 108 was the wind when I went out that day. I mean, it was crazy. And so we went on our hike. It was around 50 miles an hour wind. I mean, it's just, and it's just, you know, that's a challenge hiking just with that type of wind. And so um, I wish I could have captured that moment. I would have had, I, I couldn't even done it with a drone, but it was just kind of magical seeing all the smoke, you know, and it kind of almost looks like a cloud. And then you look over and then the storm is so low, you know, we're at 7,000 feet right here. So when we go hiking, it's just a little bit higher, but the storm was like below the mountain peaks, just right above your head. And it was just this kind of array of, um, once again, emotions, because it's times like that, you'll realize you'll never probably experience that again in your life. You know, you'll never see that off in the distance of the storm, of the, the storm come in and you're hoping that 
that storm is going to help dissipate, you know, the fires, which it did. It had a, it had a big impact on it. Yeah. So luckily it wasn't a snowstorm for us in the fire, right? Luckily it's just the snow yeah. came after the fire and helped out a little bit. Yeah. What happens is people don't realize a lot of times when that snow starts to melt, then it creates mudslides and then, and underneath it, the debris sometimes actually can help spread the fire as it goes down. If it's not completely out, we had a fire here in Evergreen like that a couple of uh, summers ago. And then we had another one in the winter. And uh, I, you know, I never, never thought about it. I've never been in that close to home because we have a lake right around the corner and they actually come in, you know, gather the water and then fly it right over to the mountain and to help disperse it. And you can see the flames all night long and you, you, the smoke, we have ash over everything, all of our cars, our driveway, everything outside. And, and when you get to that point where there's ash everywhere, you realize, you know, you're, you could be in intimate danger. Oh, and uh, it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's um, scary and challenging. And then you start debating what's valuable in your life. And I tell people this flag right here that was flown over over the Capitol is is one of my prized possessions. I, I honor that. I was given that when I was medically discharged, and so that thing has been with me for years. So that that's the thing that I would hate to lose in any fire. That'd be, I'd grab my dogs, put them in the car, and I'd come back in and get that thing. I'd probably take that thing with me, <laughs> but everything else I can let go. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know the weather here. Washington has been crazy too, right? I made rain here in the Seattle area. We used as a drizzle, like the last month. It's like an extra rain, rain, right? Yeah, like we've had I-90 closed because of blizzards, flooding, mm. like historic flooding. And there's a town called Livewell, Kansas, it's like a tourist town, like two hours from Seattle. They got like four feet of snow in like a, a one day, right? They were like shut in. Yeah, it's, it's been oh, yeah. up here. Yeah, I think Tahoe got how many? 90 inches or something, 60 inches or something in yeah, a day. Yeah, it's been craziness. Yeah. So next, talk about your one of your nonprofits, Warrior Ascent. Okay, so I um I have to kind of join that in together. So okay. I'm not, I, I'm just a provider at Warriors Ascent. I have my own nonprofit, Mike AC, but Warriors Ascent, I've been with them for six years. And that is really one of the most impactful things that I have, I've ever done. And I, and I can tell you that I've learned so much and I, and I do ask for, and I tell them this, I say, hey, I want the most critical feedback you can give me. And we start this journey on Monday and then it's over on Friday, but Thursday evening, we either sit, depends on where we're at. Sometimes we sit next to a fire or we'll sit in, in the yoga room. And I ask them and I take notes and I say, what can I do to improve or change? Give me, give me the most critical feedback. And, you know, I realize some of it, you know, isn't applicable, but a lot of it is. And I get to learn what I'm doing well and what I need to work on. And so it's veterans, Department of Corrections, personnel and essential personnel. Uh, we really focus on people that have had that kind of trauma, you know, a lot of death and experienced death. And, you know, my heart goes out to these essential personnel in Kansas City, because if you've watched any horror movie or any death or, or mayhem or whatever it is, I mean, that's what these people live. You know, the stories that they tell and the things that they've seen in Kansas City of, you know, kids being in microwaves and kids being in, in dryers and just the burn and the things that they have lived you know, were things that we could never imagine and, and how those people looked and smelt and things like that. So it's, it's heart wrenching that a lot of these people have gone through it. Same thing with the veterans. And so it's set up as a sequence. So, you know, Monday we get in and we, and we kind of talk about things. And then Tuesday is really about vulnerability, you know, about being vulnerable and being raw, because a lot of us don't understand what that means. You know, what does that really mean to be vulnerable? What does that mean for us? And, and once again, you know, we've numbed a lot of emotions. And then um, Wednesday is really about transformation of, of no longer playing that role of the victim, but playing the role of the hero and the warrior. And how I describe that to people is that like soldiers, you know, most of us are in the military. We follow direction. It tells us what to do. We do it. We may question it, but we're not really going to question authority. You know, we're going to do what we're told, you know. Um, but a warrior is a person that really forges their own path. They choose their own destiny. They make their own destiny. Um, and then, you know, so every day is kind of like a different theme. And, then, and those people's lives are truly transformed of this week. And, and the thing is, if anybody's listening or interested in or knows somebody that's struggling with PTSD, I can tell you that every single time I do this, somebody comes up and says that, you know, mindfulness, meditation, yoga, or this program has saved their life. 
hundred percent. We've had people that were going to leave on Tuesday and go commit suicide and they stayed till Wednesday. And then Thursday, they're just completely just excited again about life. They've got hope again. Um, I want to make sure that I, I always provide a space of unconditional love and acceptance. It, it's kind of odd for a lot of men, you know, but I'll walk in and, I, and when I introduce myself on Monday, I say, I'm Kerry Stewart. I'm a Gulf War veteran um, in this space that you are loved and accepted for who you are unconditionally, that there's no judgment, there's no criticism, there's no social comparison of who you are or the person next to you. And that this week, we're really going to focus on transforming and thinking about no longer playing the role of the victim, but playing the role of the hero. And it's that time that men will come back to me later and say, I'm the first grown man that's ever said that I love him, because I continue to tell them that entire week that I love him and that I care for him. And it's a thing that a lot of men don't share with other men. And that allows me to be vulnerable, but it allows them a space to be vulnerable, to be raw and to be authentic. Um, and so I still get text messages all the time, which is great, that say, you know, Warriors Ascent, you know, or my yoga or mindfulness, however you want to play, part of that played a role in saving and transforming their lives. And they are just completely grateful for that week. And it's free. So all they have to do is get there and show up and they get a week long Academy of Healing with a bunch of different providers, but I'm primarily the one that's there. You know, I'm there from the morning, from sunrise to sunset, and I, I do a variety of different talks. So we'll talk about holistic methods to healing or self-care or self-love or even Ayurveda. We talk about exercise and sleep, and turning conflict into intimacy or healthy boundaries. So we have a lot of discussions that people have never thought about. Uh, how does this work in my life? What does a healthy boundary look like? Or how can I take the conflict into my life and turn it into intimacy? So talk about men's health. Um, so I'm on TikTok a lot, probably too mm -hmm. much, I admit. <laughs> and there was a, 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 and a lady posted a question on there. Like, you know, TikTok, you can post a question, people stitch. She posted a question. She's like, I generally want to know if you're a man on this app and something's going wrong or you're depressed or something's not going right, who do you go to? And literally thousands of men posted, no one, I'm a man. No one cares what I think. I can't, t I'm like literally, and like, and all the females, like, they were like heartbroken, right? How do we, yeah. I mean, how do we fix this? Is it fixable? I mean, cause. Oh like yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just, first of all, you have to find somebody you trust. You have to find somebody that loves you and accepts you and that the ego isn't going to get in the way. So if I ever see posts like that, or I see anything, I always just, respond and say, hey, if there's anything anybody that's reading this thread needs, or if you ever feel, you know, suicidal or depressed or anxious, here's my phone number. You can call or text me anytime. And I think that's that's part of it is knowing that there's somebody out there that they can reach to because I get these messages all the time and phone calls all the time. Um, and I think that that's what and I've been talking about this a lot and I think people get confused, but that's what we're really missing in our politics today and our leaders, our spiritual leaders, somebody that really knows who they are and knows their ag agenda. They're not going to flip flop and say, oh, this year I don't like gays and this next year I do like gays or I'm not for this. I'm not for that. You know, they need to decide who they are and, and what they are. But I think what we need is is people to know that they can reach out anytime to somebody that loves and cares for them. I think what's unfortunate is we have a whole group of society, a whole group of men that their ego has gotten in the way. And they've never told anybody they love them or really felt love from another man. And so, yeah. It's, it, Do you think people more more likely to reach out to someone they don't know for these kind of things versus like a best friend or wife or someone close to them? I think it depends. I mean, you know, I have, I have a friend, unfortunately, he just passed away a couple of weeks ago of, of COVID, but he was a very big advocate for mental health in the police department in newton kansas in wichita area and he would be like somebody struggling they knew to reach out to him so he was kind of like the go-between guy he was a very big advocate for warriors ascent but at least once a month at least once a month i'm talking to one of his colleagues either it's you know somebody that's driving an ambulance or a fire department or, or police department that is struggling and i mean thankfully you know a few months ago one of the guys was suicidal and I got on the phone with him and I talked to him and, and I didn't resolve the issue. I got him in touch with people that can resolve the issue. And I think that's kind of knowing, once again, the healthy boundaries of, hey, this my gifts and talents, this is not my realm, but I'm going to get you to where we can get you help. And thankfully, the guy's still with us today, you know. Um, but I think that's part of it is where's our 
spiritual leaders. I'm not talking about a religious affiliate. I'm not talking about, you know, part of being a religion. I'm talking about somebody that has enlightenment, somebody that really truly cares about our community and will do whatever they can, you know, and I, I think it's, it's possible. I just think we need a, a revolution. We need, we need people that are finally sick of it. And it's like, this is my belief system. This is what I believe in. This is what I understand. This is what I get. And I'm going to, I'm going to stand up for that. So, okay, what's your thoughts on this, your opinions, or maybe you know the answer, right? So, you no, know, suicide is a big thing. It's a bad thing. Hopefully I asked this question correctly. But I can suppose you ask someone, hey, are you doing okay? Are, are you all right? And if they say, well, I'm actually thinking about committing suicide, and you help them out. But do most people actually commit suicide? Do they even admit to it? Like you ask them, like somebody might be planning to kill themselves. You say, are you okay? Can I help you? And they say, no, I'm fine. And next they commit suicide. Do most do the stats show that most people actually commit it, reach out to help or anything like that, or this, oh, let's go do it? Well, I don't know the stats statistically, United States or even globally, but I can say that any anybody that's ever reached out to me, we've always been able to help and, and find somebody to help and provide them help, and even you know, even with a friend. So the thing is, I think it's how you you kind of lead by example and you give people hope. That's what that's what we're really lacking, right? Is hope for all mankind. So how do you address that situation? I think a lot of times my story, my path, my journey of where I was is an inspiration to other people because I could have committed suicide multiple times, right? And I could have ended my life, but I don't know my future connections. And if I would have done that, I wouldn't have been able to make the impact that I have on other people's lives, you know? So I think personally, from my experience, everybody that's reached out, you know, we, I have not had anybody personally commit suicide after they've reached out to me. That's great. I mean, even, even going, and it's, it's challenging me for to say this because I, I know this could change, but then statistically, you know, before Warriors of Sin, there was one person that committed suicide before I joined the, the organization. So in the last six years, every single person that has gone through, not one person has committed suicide. And that that may change, but it, it's a great statistic that, you know, I, I can say that I've had a positive impact on a lot of people's lives. Thousands, great news. Great news. thousands of people. Yeah. So, Kerry, next, I, talk, talk some more about MYKC. And specifically, I want you to talk about your core values and the process that you went through to come up with the core values for M MYKC. Yeah. So basically, to me, my KC is... Uh, it has two dual meanings, all right? So one of them is if it's my Krishna con conscience is what, you know, my people from India told me, but I didn't realize that at the, at the other time, but it was just kind of like, you know, my, my opportunity to really, really connect. And I've kind of redone the, um, I would say, rebranded, you know, over the last year with mindfulness, knowledge, uh, yoga, and community. And so what we want to do is really have an opportunity just to connect with anybody we can in the community on different levels. So what I do is I provide yoga, mindfulness, meditation, uh, and I do these talks. So the same thing that I do for Warriors Ascent, if you wanted me to come out to Seattle, I would do the same thing. Just and it really depends. Sometimes it is a week long retreat. Sometimes it's condensed down into a couple of days or things like that. But giving people the opportunity really just to find acceptance, find love, find the things that they're, they're wanting, you know? And so I think it's just doing that. So to me, it's about social enrichment. How can I, I ask myself this each and every morning, how can I enrich my life? How can I focus on myself, self-care, reset, find healing energy, find forgiveness, get with, get rid of the guilt, the shame, the grief. How can I find all those things in order to give those to other people? Right. And then once I can do that for myself, then I can really focus on the community. But I think that's where a lot of people get lost in their journey and their path is that they want to give and give and give and focus on everybody else, but they don't want to be alone with themselves. And then once we're alone with ourselves, then we can actually focus on healing and caring and loving and knowing what's really important and what our true values are. Um, so with a nonprofit, what I'm able to do, to do is provide yoga mats, so I, I do Manduka. I, I believe in quality. I really want to provide you a great foundation. So it's a yoga mat. It's two blocks. It's a journal that I've published in a yoga strap and a blanket because I want your foundation and mindfulness and meditation to be solid. And, and our primary focus the first entire day is all about breath. 
because that's what I learned through my journey and my past. So basically I'm giving people the modalities and the things that have worked for me and I'm giving that to the community. And, I'm, and I know it's a proven record because I've been doing it now for seven years, uh, but I've been working with Warriors Ascent for six years. And I know this method works. It worked for me and it's worked for thousands of other people. Um, and it's just, it's really a foundation starting with your breath. Can you talk some about your, uh, let's talk some about your actual yoga journey. Like, how did you find yoga? Like, you know, mm. you know, why you got so involved with it? Talk about your journey some in yoga. Yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. So go back to when I retired and physically, I was just physically, mentally, spiritually, I was in a very dark place. I was very suicidal. I was very anxious. Um, I had a lot of guilt and shame from the military that I couldn't, I couldn't overcome. And it's still a challenge today, right? When, when you take a lot of innocent lives uh, during war, you, it's hard to find forgiveness. And then you, you want to blame, you know, other people for that. And, and then you start thinking about your own family. So I know that that played a lot of role in it. A lot of it was just my overall environment. So what I did was um, I retired and then I went out to New Jersey for that Gulf War test. And that's when they told me my situation is immunizations and exposure. You know, right. And so they didn't tell me at the time, but now I've done the research. And so they're pretty much guessing. And it was the anthrax. So that you give you the anthrax and then you're around this very unhealthy, very toxic environment on all levels. Um, and so they suggested three things. They suggested biofeedback. And at that point, I had no idea what that was. I'm like, I don't know what biofeedback is, but okay. Tai Chi, which I knew what Tai Chi was, it's cool fluids, and then yoga. And then I'm like, man, there's so much different types of yoga. So I was ironic because as soon as I got back, I already had an appointment with a provider, Dr. Black. I'll never forget this guy. He had kind of long hair like us, gray hair, you know, and I go into the, the doctor there at Leavenworth and he's kind of talking to me about like mushrooms and transcendence and like getting high. And I'm like, is this guy testing me? Like, is he asking me <laughs> questions to see if I'll fall for this? Like I couldn't get it, couldn't get out. And I, and I say they, they put you in a big comfy chair and they check your oxygen, they check your pulse, your breath, they're checking everything before and after the session. It's a 20 minute session. You sit in a big comfy chair and he's like, he's like, what kind of music you like? I'm like, I like this nature relaxing stuff. And then he put something cool on the screen and I just focused on my breath. And it was the first time, you know, in over 20 years that I left the VA, VA hospital more relaxed than I went in. Every time I go to the VA hospital, I'm stressed. I'm anxious. I'm frustrated. You know, I walk away and they didn't help me. They didn't do anything for me. This is the first time that I felt more calm and more relaxed. And I said, okay, I'm just going to focus on my breath because it, I think it was about a 45 minute, at least drive home. So the whole time I just focused on the breath and then I got home. I'm like, this is the most relaxed I've been. I don't even remember. So I started diving into what is mindfulness what is biofeedback and then i i started doing my own routine every morning so i would get up i love lake tahoe so if anybody's been to lake tahoe it's one of those places that to me it's just magical evergreen's like a mini tahoe i think that's probably why i've ended up in, in evergreen and i have a photo that i've taken of a little boat there and then the water's just crystal clear and it's just it's magical you can see the rock formation and I'd sit there and I'd get on my couch and where the arm of the couch is, I would put my legs over that and I have a bunch of pillows and blankets behind me. I'd light some incense, light a diffuser. I like it warm, had it warm. And then I just turned up music kind of loud that was calming and relaxing. And I'd sit there and look at Lake, Lake Tahoe and I'd set my intention for forgiveness. And I would be like, how can I forgive myself? How can I forgive myself of everything that I've done, right? How can I release this guilt and this shame? And then I would be like, okay, I need some healing energy. I would start to observe what's going on in my body. Is my back sore, leg sore? Just a general observation of what's going on with me, uh, just really physically, and then dive into mentally and spiritually. And from that observation is when I would say, okay, this needs to be my intention today because you know I'm feeling a little heartbroken or I'm feeling a little sad. You know, because at those times I'm very depressed, I'm very anxious. And I would start off every morning doing that for about 30 to 45 minutes. Then I would do it again at lunch and then I would do it in the evening. 
Um, and I started feeling a lot better. And then when I had like a trigger, you know, something happened in my life, any kind of drama or something, I'd step away from that and I would go be mindful and meditate. And then I started actually walking to city parks in Kansas City and I would just take a blanket or whatever, find a spot and I would just sit there and look at the trees or the clouds or whatever it is and sit there and meditate for 30 to 45 minutes. And I did this every day. And I realized a whole complete change and transformation. So about six months after that is when the first time I stepped into a yoga studio, because I talked to my daughter also, and she was in California. She's like, I think yoga would be beneficial for you. I'd listen to her more than I'd listen to the VA. <laughs> so I'm like, well, the VA suggested it, but I want your advice because she'd been doing yoga. So uh, there was actually a yoga studio on the same street. So I just walk up to the yoga, yoga studio, went in, and I thought that you're supposed to be mindful and be present and, and focus on these slow, deep, you know, oceanatic breaths. And I thought that this was the whole process. I thought everybody did that. So I just sat down and I'm like, okay, my intention today is just going to be patient. So I'm just going to be patient in acceptance of where I'm at in this yoga class. And I'll never forget, because if you've ever go to a yoga class the first time, you always sit way in the back, right? You're like, oh, I don't, I want to see what everybody else is doing. I don't know anything about all these crazy poses and stuff. I'm, I'm going to be back and observe. I couldn't do a damn pose, brother. I couldn't do one. I felt like it was a one-on-one. -on -one. I felt bad for that instructor because she had to keep coming all the way from the front, all the way to the back and helping me get into these poses and do these things. But I tell you, when I left, I was so calm and so relaxed and I was like, wow, this is really transformative. So I went back a couple more times and it was, it was around the winter and I met this young girl and she's like, uh, I took off two weeks from work and I'm doing two yoga sessions every day. So I'm doing yoga for 14 days straight. It's like, well, shit, I can do yoga for 30 days straight. I'm retired. So I dove in and I did it. I, I, I almost did every single one at that studio, but we had some so snow and ice storms in Kansas City and they closed down the studio. So I just did it at home. And I'm like, this is very transformative. When you're that calm, that relaxed, you're focusing on your intention. You're doing these slow, deep box breathing. Like you feel great. You feel calm. I said, this is very life-changing. So I dove into yoga teacher training. I started volunteering at a bunch of studios in Kansas City. And then I opened up my own studio as my own nonprofit. Um, and it went really, really well. It was just, it was an amazing adventure and journey. And, you know, it's an opportunity for me to connect and give back. So the studio is no longer a physical studio. I do a lot of things like this. I meet with a lot of clients on mindfulness, meditation, breath work, or I even talk about healthy boundaries or turning conflict into intimacy. So Due to COVID, it's, it's kind of helped expand because now this is normal for us to be able to connect. Instead of me sitting down at your front table, your, your table in your dining room or wherever it is, your office, we can connect virtually. Um, I still prefer the opportunity to connect in person and, and do that. So that's basically that nonprofit and my journey and path with yoga. So I did teacher training in Kansas City, then I went to India. And that's when I learned a whole different level because it's kind of the bhakti, like the universal love out in a place called Echo Village, outside of India, outside of Mumbai. Oh man, I wanna say an hour and a half or two hours, but it's all village that they've created that's natural. I mean, they take raw sewage and they filter it and they have a display. So you sit here next to this raw sewage, they pump it up into this big vat and then they have big rocks, small rocks, sand, and then they have this plexiglass on the side so you can see the filtration. And then you can see all these plants they've they have certain plants that help absorb all the waste and then they pump it over to this other bat and you can see the water's completely clear and there's no odor to it and then they pump it out and they use it for all the vegetation so like you could walk out your villa there and there could be like mango and banana and it's just it, it's amazing so they pump in um or they bring in rice and then they bring in filtered water for the tourists but basically everything you need is right there on this village they've made their own bricks they've made everything out of the land right there it's just it's it it was very nice going to a place that where you feel truly unconditional love and acceptance for an entire month um and then i came back and just dove deeper into all those concepts and 
from the feedback from Warriors of Sin and from other things is where I've kind of derived these other topics because we have a lot of internal conflict. How can we create that to intimacy? We don't have healthy boundaries. Most of us with PTS have allowed other people to take advantage of us or, and we get to the point where you know we're a trigger. We don't know if it's a bomb or a bear. Somebody's pulled out in front of me. I'm just going to explode, right? So how can we have healthy boundaries? How can we set in a life of self-care? You know, how can we devote more time to ourselves each and every day? And that's how that whole journey and the whole path is. So I want to be able to connect to people on a different level. I want to enrich the lives of our community. And I want our community to go back to loving and accepting each other for who they are. You know, so, back so two random organizations like. So you're the third guest of the last five who's bought up like psychedelics, mushrooms, marijuana. So I think that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. And then talking about mushrooms, um, hopefully it's still open. There's a, I was stationed in Fort Liverworth for a year with my family. Mm -hmm. And I think it's called a, a Zona Rosa in Kansas City. Yeah. Like, so there's a place there called, Her I think it's called Herford House. Yes. I mean, they had, I just remember they, they had the best stuff mushrooms we've ever had, right? <laughs> <laughs> and right, we always joke around like let's fly back to Kansas City, go get some stuff off and right. So I, I, that came up in my mind. Yeah. Well, well, if you ever come back when I'm leading a retreat at Warriors of Sin, you can come check it out. You know, I think it would be a great, great, great connection, great opportunity. I I only get advice. I know with marijuana, you know, everything in moderation, right? And so from the studies and statistics with moderation, what happens is people dive into it too much. So instead of just taking one or two hits you know, a day, they're smoking all this. And then what happens is it, cre it actually increases their PTSD. It increases their depression, increases their anxiety. They become more lethargic, lazy. They don't want to exercise. It messes up their sleep routine. Everything in moderation. The people that I've known that have done the mushrooms, um, even though it's not legal in America, right? They've, they've done them. And then there's a place in Costa Rica. Actually, there's a veteran from Kansas City that has a place down in Costa Rica. It's all monitored. They want to make sure you're in a safe space, you know, so you start off little micro dosing, checking in, checking in, and then you have like a buddy system and they have a whole mythology that they use that works. And, and what they've all said was that like, it's taken them to the next level, like Warriors Ascent, you know, the mindfulness yoga, all those things are really great concepts. They're very, very useful, but there's still something they feel like a lot of them are missing. And once they go through and do, you know, the, the mushroom aspect of it, it's really cleared and cleansed and got everything out, right? So maybe for me, you know, doing the mindfulness and meditation, I have more time to devote to it, you know, but sometimes we need a little enhancement. We need a little amplifier to help us, you know, get our life back to where it was. And I think those can be tools as long as it's everything in moderation. So Carrie, how does one become a yoga instructor? It's like, you got to take a certain class or course, you have to travel mm -hmm. to India, does say you're a yoga instructor. <laughs> I mean, I'm I sure mean, anyone, I can, no, anyone can say, hey, I'm, I'm Jason Cavs. I'm going to do yoga now, right? Right. I mean, there's a lot of corporate places in America. And I suggest people, you know, if you're going to go, go to a place, you know, like Core Power, they have the best extensive training manual out there. But once again, there's no spiritual aspect to it. You're not going to dive into the spiritual, unless you're already a spiritual person, they're not going to provide that path. They're going to provide a, a, a path of, I would say least resistance. It's going to be short, concise, precise. You're going to get a lot of the core values. And if it really resonates with you, go someplace like India and spend a month with people like in the bhakti that really provide a path of unconditional love and acceptance. So basically, you know, anybody that applies is going to get accepted. You know, you're just going to pay. It's kind of like college. You know, I mean, there's a requirement, but as long as you can make it through and pay, you know, and, and pass the grades, you're going to have a college degree. It's what you do with it afterwards, right? How do you, how do you expand on that understanding and that mindfulness? Because it's only 200 hours. I mean, you don't, there's hardly anything going on in 200 hours, you know? And so the thing, I may have dogs barking soon. <laughs> Hang on one second. I got to shut my door. All right. <laughs> We live out here in rural Colorado, so we have septic and propane and all of that, and we have a shared driveway. And so um, propane tanks right in front of my house and my dogs bark it. They'll bark at anything. I don't, I, I don't even hear anything, but they're out there barking. And I'm like, what is, what's going on? <laughs> so basically anybody could do that. 
you know, they're going to, I don't know anybody that didn't go through a teacher training that didn't get approved uh, to be a, a, an instructor, but you, there's a lot of pressure, right? Because you have a lot of celebrity lo- yogis and then usually the people that are instructing are very, very good. So a lot of times we feel like we have to emulate that person or be as good as that person to teach. And that's just not always the case. You know, it, it, is it Sedona, Arizona, like a known like yogi place too? Yeah, there's a, supposedly like a, a, a vortex of energy in Sedona. Uh, when I went there, I really didn't feel it. I feel it more in Tahoe and Evergreen than I feel there. I feel more connected to myself and spirituality in the mountains than I do in the desert. Um, I, I, to me, it's just it, being around all the trees and all the nature. And I just I love Evergreen because of all the wildlife. You know, we have so much amazing wildlife, deer and elk and coyote and fox, you know, and we have a creek right in front of our house. So like the neighbors, you know, they had a little otter and then the other lady had a, a, a turtle. And so I've seen osprey and uh, herring and uh, eagles. So to me, that's more of a spiritual connection. And I think that's part of it. I think part of the problem that we have in America is that we're in these toxic environments mentally, physically, spiritually. So physically, a lot of us live in a city that's very toxic. We're not connected to a lot of the people in the city. You know, there's a lot of stress, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of pollution. And so what happens is you're around all this energy all the time and you don't really get the opportunity to release. And so when people get out into nature, they start to feel this connection. And I think that's that's been one of the biggest problems for a lot of people is understanding their wants and their needs. When I lived in Kansas City, I was in the plaza and it offered everything that I ever wanted. I could hop on the bus right right by the street. The bus would take me to the VA hospital. I could walk to restaurants. I could walk to grocery stores. I could walk to the gym. I could walk anywhere. I did not have to drive. But the environment was just very, very toxic. toxic. So for me, being more rural, being out in nature is everything I need to heal, to reset, to recover and repair. So I think it's, as part of it is, you know, finding that balance of what is it you really, really need? What is it you want? And how can you start to heal and recover? Is is there some type of like uh, annual yoga instructor conference that y'all go to like compare notes and compare like, you know, (laughs) different things? That's, that's, that would be a great idea, but no, there's nothing. There are a lot of trainings you have to do I think it's 30 hours, like every three years of additional training, you know, and it can be, that can be a variety of different things, but um, there's not like a conference like that. There, there's a national, I would say kids yoga Alliance conference. It's kind of like that. And that's in DC and that's a really, it's at uh, Washington university there. And it's really awesome. It's a really awesome, awesome experience. But a lot of times, you know, people don't share um, or people People, a lot of times in the yoga community, you got to think is like people like me. I, uh, I went through it because of trauma experiences. I went through it because I was struggling. And so there's a lot of us out there that go through yoga, but even they think that yoga is going to solve all their problems, this yoga training, and it doesn't. You still got to do all the work. It's not that magic pill, that magic button. So I think a lot of times these people, they go through it thinking that all these problems are going to be resolved and it's not. It's like, oh, now I'm aware that I'm the problem. <laughs> I got to focus on myself. How can I heal myself? Right. So a lot of people go through the training and then they never end up being a yoga instructor. I have a ton of them, but what I talk about through training is it's more like life coaching. I talk about using your gifts and talents. Like I've had one that's become a very, very successful realtor, right? She's mindful. She uses all those same techniques of being mindful of being present, you know, of everything she can as if you were to come into her yoga class, that's how she treats you as a customer, as a guest. So, you know, going through training, I would say it's just like the college, if, if you can go through one that's very spiritual and offers, this, you know, an opportunity for transformation, it's going to help you in your everyday life. It's going to help you with your communication with anybody in your life. And there's actually like many types of yoga, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So and how, how, do you pick, how do you pick the one yoga that you use? What are you doing well, that one? So I talked about doshas. I do a, I do a talk when I do Warriors of Sin or any of those retreats, I just do a real short thing over dosha. So it's kind of like you're predisposed to have certain elements. And depending on your dosha, there are certain types of yoga that you would 
you would enjoy. And it's funny because I go back and before I knew or understood Ayurveda or doshas, there were certain yogas that resonated with me. One of them is yin, which is like a deep stretch. And I turned that into a guided meditation. So you're supine, you're on your back or sides or whatever. You're not standing, but you'll hold postures, you know, like a leg stretch, arm stretch, shoulder stretch for like three to five minutes. And I'm meditating and talking to you through that. So that really resonates with me. And then the second one is like a vinyasa flow where you're doing breath to movement. So you would inhale to a warrior one and then you would exhale into like a revolved side angle, inhale to like a high lunge, exhale, you know, extended side angle, things like that. So every inhale, you're doing one breath, every exhale or a movement. And then every exhale, you're doing another one. The one that I don't like is like a hatha. A hatha is where like you'd get into a warrior one, hold it for 60 seconds, warrior two, 60 seconds. And I mean, I just, with my medical conditions, I just, I cannot, it, I, I can't even focus standing and holding those postures. So there's those types. There's Kundalini where it's a breath. It's really intense. Aerial is another one where like you're in an aerial hammock. Those are great for anybody and everybody. I always suggest aerial classes. So the, and then you have like a power heated vinyasa. And then you have the hybrid where some of them may be like a hatha and a yin mixed together. So you have all these different types of methods. So what I do in my yoga teacher training is I, I every weekend or every time we have a session is I introduce you to one of those. So we start off with yin because yin's the, the one that's on the ground. And then hatha, you can incorporate that. And then we go into a vinyasa, power vinyasa. And then we do aerial. And so I let you know like all the different types of yoga in my teacher training. So you're aware of all of them. And then I actually uh, insist that part of the, the prerequisite is that you go to at least five other yoga studios and do five different types of classes at those studios. And you do feedback and, and do an observation. And I give them like the, the form and everything to do because it's important for them to have that diversity and understand it. So, you know, I always say, you know, with, the, with exposure, you're granted understanding. With that understanding, you're granted enlightenment. And that's how it was in the military or anything you do. CC's pizza, relationships. And so you have to expose yourself to those other types of yoga to understand whether or not they serve you or not. Those other types of relationships. We've all been in toxic relationships, right? We didn't know they were toxics until we get out of it. I talk about like, you know, in one of my talks, when I talk about holistic methods to healing and, and gut and, and what, you know, the journey of your food, you know, for years, I always had stomach aches. And then I started going gluten-free and organic and I didn't have stomach aches all the time. But Tradition is, you know, winter comes around, I get a hot chocolate. And I went into a, a QT there in Kansas City, got my hot chocolate, and then my stomach started hurting. It's like, oh, and I was like, man, my stomach used to hurt all the time. This was normal for me. But once you take all that negative toxic energy out, and whether that may be for the city for you or some people, maybe it's the country, wherever it is. But once you take that out and you feel relaxed and calm and then you put it back in, that's not normal. You don't have to have a toxic life. You can have a healthy, holistic life. And so that's the same thing with your yoga. Find what really serves you and don't feel like you have to do the other things. Yoga truly is a way of life. It really is. It, it's, it's this conversation. It's how we approach the people in our life. It's how we think about the journey of our food. It's how we think of nature. It's being mindful. It's being present. It's being in the moment. It's finding gratitude, acceptance, love, and, and it's being okay with positive and negative emotions. When the fear and the anxiety comes up, why do I have those emotions? You know, so it's not just the thing you see on the map. Yoga truly is a way of life. And it's understanding what really serves you and using your gifts and talents for our community. Just like you, you're, you say you're not creative, but this podcast is probably, is probably a gift and talent that a lot of people don't feel like they're capable of doing. Yeah, and they're not. True. Because right. I, I, I know you talk a lot about the one hour of the mat, but then the 23 hours living your local yoga life, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that could be anything. I mean, when you sit down to eat, think about the journey of your food. Are you mindful and present when you're eating your food? You know, when when you're driving the car and you're going to work and it's a 20 minute commute, are you OK being in the moment? Right. And, and being OK, your morning routine, all of that stuff can add up to an hour. You know, I say if you, all you have is eight to 10 minutes in the morning to focus on mindfulness and your breath. Dedicate that eight to 10 minutes, but then on your way to work, do the same thing. And when you're at work, do the same thing, you know, because the way home and then in the evening, make sure that you go out and spend some time in nature. We go out every single day unless I'm in way too much pain. Otherwise, you know, in the summer and the other months, I'm out three times a day. 
they're not long, always hikes. Sometimes they're 15, 20 minutes, but if I'm feeling really good, it could be 45 minutes or an hour. You know, last year I would say I finally made it to the top of Mount Evergreen. I think that was an hour, maybe an hour and a half up and then like 45 minutes. And that was the first time that I've ever done that in the three years we've lived here. So it doesn't have to be like, hey, understand your physical limitations. Understand that I'm not going to overextend myself today and then I'm not going to be able to move for the next day. You know, just be mindful, be present. And that's really the yoga way of life, man. And also goes to emotional intelligence. How do you how do you make other people feel? You know, and what is, what do you think about and, and lose that entitlement and lose that ego and be be humble and love and accept yourself. Because if I don't love and accept myself, I can't love and accept others. It's impossible for me to give something I don't possess. You know, and I think a lot of times we act like it and we try to be that, but we realize, hey, there's something missing in our lives. And a lot of times it's just love and respect for ourselves and hope. So, Kerry, you talked about, like, you know, the positive about yoga, the pros of it. Are there any cons of yoga, you know, anything difficult about it? And is there any situation where you, where you, you tell someone yoga is not for you? No, there's always some kind of yoga for everybody, right? So, you know, there may be the high intensity physical power of vinyasa that's not, you know, for somebody that has, you know, type of ailments, bursitis, or, you know, things like that. But anybody can be alone and be with themselves. So, I mean, journaling can be a form of yoga going for a hike, a walk. What people realize like when they go through Warriors Ascent is because I'll always ask them on Thursday and everybody's perception is different, right? One of the ladies absolutely loved and, and adored her through her journey and her path and everything. And she was just so excited to finally like be in this space because it's a whole week to spend with yourself. It's a whole week to just like focus on yourself and, and love and accept for you, who you are. So Thursday, she's like, and she always had like this little poppy thing and she's talking and she's like, Carrick, I found out what my yoga is. I finally figured it out. I was like, well, it's only been four days, but I'm happy for you. Sometimes it takes people four years. She's like, deer hunting. And all the, <laughs> lady, all the other ladies are like shocked. They're like, what? She goes, I know for some of you, you know, maybe, but she goes, I'm alone. I'm in nature. And it's not about whether or not I get a deer. It's about being connected. And she goes, that's the time that like I'm in prayer. That's the time that I feel empowered. That's the time that I feel excited about life. And she goes, and I don't have to be with anybody. And she goes, I'm not. When I go deer hunting, I'm all by myself. I don't hunt with anybody else. And she goes, that's my former yoga. And that's what it is, brother. I mean, really, you know, your journey, your path. Where, where is it that you can be mindful and be present? Where is it that you don't have to focus on the future or the past? You can just be right here, you know? And that's a great example. You know, a lot of people, it's, it's running or jogging or hiking or fishing, right? Those are all forms of yoga. They may not serve you, but they serve a lot of people. So there's always some kind of form of yoga. So it doesn't have to be that physical aspect of being on the mat, but what is it you're doing for that hour of self-care? And if it's fishing, that's going to allow you to reset and heal and connect on a completely different level, then it's go fishing, man. Go fishing every day you can, you know? Carrie, what does it mean? What, well, what's your definition of being authentic? Mm. Oh, that's a good one. I would say to me, it's, it's being completely vulnerable, that I'm not hiding anything, right? So once again, it doesn't mean that you don't have healthy boundaries because you could ask me a question that I'm saying, I'm not prepared to answer, I'm not prepared to discuss. But it's really allowing yourself to be so raw, so authentic, and so genuine that you're completely open up and you're not hiding, right? You know, a lot of times we have this physical mask and a lot of times we have other masks that we're wearing in our life. It's, it's removing that mask. It's kind of like this, you know, can you hear my dogs? Yeah, 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 it's fine. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of like this. I, that's why and I talk about this this week with warriors, right? So if we're all warriors, we feel safe about with being around other warriors. If I know you're going to protect me, I know you're going to take care of me, then I can let down my guard at certain times, right? When I go out and I have to protect my community, I have to serve my community, then I need to put on this guard and I need to make sure that I have even more stringent, healthy boundaries. But if I'm in a room with just warriors, 
I can be completely, totally authentic with you guys because I know you're going to love, you're going to accept, and you're going to respect me. You're going to give me the proper feedback. It's not going to be biased. It's not going to be, you know, to the point where it's a cancel culture where you're no longer invited. It's like, how can we work together as a community through this? So next, uh, I, I remember hearing this story somewhere. I can't remember where, but basically the person said, you know, like, um, like, like, suppose you have like past trauma, right? Mm -hmm. And like somebody did something bad to you, they ask for forgiveness, you forgive them. And so like you give them the forgiveness, like taking the nail out of the fence. But even though you can forgive mm -hmm. someone, that hole is still there. And problem have, people have problem dealing with a hole that's still left behind. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? What's your advice on that? Yeah, yeah. So basically, there's a, there's a couple of things. You, you won't forget, right? So like we're in a society a lot of times where we want to judge and condemn people because they don't look or behave the way we do. So say, for example, there's a mask mandate, right? And you have to wear a mask. Well, there's a lot of women that I've talked to over the last two years, over the last six years that have been raped. A lot of them have been raped while they're in the military serving our country, right? Normally what happens is somebody puts their hand over their face. Putting that mask on their face reminds them of that, that journey and that path, right? So we need to make sure that we understand and, and give people acceptance and forgiveness of where they're at. I think it's to the point where what we need to do is um, we need to offer a whole entire level of acceptance and love and forgiveness but we need to meet people where they're at. Tell me the question one more time because my mind just went blank. Yeah, no worry. So like, like so someone does something <laughs> the bad. Trauma, the, oh, the, yeah, the, the trauma. Oh, the now. The, 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 okay. the hole in the fence. Yeah, with the guy doing the propane out here and the dogs barking, I got distracted. So basically, my theory and my path that's helped me the most with that is not forgetting, but forgiving. So once again, it's healthy boundaries. So if you come up to me and you're mad and you're angry and you punch me in the face and you're like, oh man, I'm sorry. And I said, well, what does sorry mean? What does sorry mean to you? Does that mean you're never going to do it again? Because that's what it means to me, right? So once again, when we establish the healthy boundaries and we're communicating effectively what I expect out of the person that has created that trauma and that trigger, then we can kind of move forward. So I'll tell you one thing that's very been, very been extremely helpful for me is a letter of intention. So... I write letters of intentions to people I've hurt, people that have hurt me, people I've loved, and people who love me. And it's always in a positive regard of where we're at today. But that's helped me release a lot of that pain, that anguish. In Kansas City, there was a lady that had been raped multiple times by this guy. And uh, she ended up actually forgiving the guy. And then they did a series of talks in person. And she goes... I understand the situation he is at, and I've been able to forgive him. Will I ever forget? No. And so he explains his story, why he took advantage of the woman that he did. She tells her story of how she's been able to forgive him. And it lets me know that even like that has got to be one of the most triggering, toxic times in our life of a woman being raped, right? But she's able to forgive this guy. So it's really a lot of times of motivation of what does that really mean? Because is it a projection or a reflection of ourselves? And what's stopping us for forgiving? Because when you can't forgive somebody, they have control over you. You're allowing that person to control you. And so you've got you've to let that go and no longer allow that person to control you, to find love, to find forgiveness, to find peace. Now, I'm not going to say that it's, it's taking the nail out, but what I'm saying is, you know, maybe it's, it's the opportunity that you're really being free because i don't want anybody to control me i don't want to feel like i'm obsessed and this person's occupying too much of my time energy and effort. now me writing that letter of intention and now i never have i never write these letters i have them all on a google drive i never have the intention of sending that letter to anybody but i've written it and then as another trigger or a memory or something pops up then i can type it and rewrite and, and edit it and go through that but it's always in a positive content. It's always the lessons that I've learned through that experience. Carrie, from your point of view, do we have a mental health crisis in, in the United yes, States? Yes, 100%. And it's getting worse. Um, and once again, that goes back to the spiritual lack of spiritual leaders that we have on all levels. Not only politically, 
but in a lot of businesses. We, we don't have a lot of emotional intelligence. We don't have a lot of empathy. We don't have a lot of knowledge and understanding. We're very siloed and selective and it's my agenda and my agenda only without your perception. And we're gonna have a higher suicide rate over this next year. We have more stress than ever. We, our political leaders have taken so much away from us instead of empowering us. We need to feel empowered, right? We, we, being the victim, right, is enabling him. If, if your daughter's an alcoholic and you keep giving her money to go buy alcohol, you're enabling her. But if you empower her to get sober and empower her to live a life of, of sobriety, of fulfillment, that's what we need as a whole entire uh, society. We need people that will empower one another, not enable another one another. We need a whole society that is going to give us the opportunity to really live life in abundance and not feel ro so restricted. And we, we're, I say it's good and bad. We have a higher attendance already right now for Warriors Descent this year than we've had forever. And it's because so many people are struggling. So I'm happy for that. But in the downturn, I realize there's so many people out there that aren't going to make it this year, that are going to commit suicide. They're going to, you know, commit violent crimes and commit things that shouldn't be. We should be a society that loves and cares for one another. And we're just not to that point. We're not accepting one another. Um, and so a lot of people get confused when I talk about the spiritual aspect of it, because what we need is really truly spiritual leaders. We don't need these people that are wishy-washy. We need people to stand up for values and ethics. I don't know one thing, like talking about solace, one thing that drives me crazy, there's so many people who are like live in bubbles and they think the world evolves around only them, right? They have no consideration yeah. for anyone else. You know, it's them, 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 and they have no idea how what they do or don't do impacts others. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. Yeah, we need to love and accept ourselves so we can stop hurting each other. Because a lot of times that's just a projection or self-reflection of ourselves. We don't love ourselves. We're upset with ourselves and we take it out on our community. The way we drive, the way we act, the way we behave. And I'm not talking about, you know, healthy boundaries. I'm just talking about generally like the way people drive or the way people are being treated, right? There's, we've lost respect for ourselves and for others. And we have a whole realm of self-entitlement, you know? And part of that is, you know, we need term limits on our politicians. We need to get rid of lobbyists, you know? I, I, you know, I, I will go back and say, that's probably the biggest fan I was of Trump was that he didn't have a, lot, a bunch of lobbyists in his pocket, you know, like Elon Musk with Tesla doesn't have a lot, bunch of lobbyists for him. He's just like, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it happen, right? Elon Musk has been very successful without all the lobbyists. So, you know, I think without me having a hidden agenda. So if you want to go back to being authentic, that's another thing is do I have a hidden agenda or I'm exactly telling you straight up how it is. And I feel like that's where we're at with a lot of these politicians. There's a hidden agenda that we don't even realize that they have, that they haven't revealed to us. And they're not being authentic, real and genuine. Prime example say the mayor of Kansas City, if you ever provide any type of feedback on his social media post, they remove it. They only allow positive responses. Well, that's not being genuine. That's not being raw. That's not being authentic. I've not seen a real glimpse of the people's perception with you. If you go onto Twitter, he can't remove all those posts. So whatever, you know, that's why he doesn't post as much on Twitter is because, you know, he gets all this feedback but if you look at a post right after he posts it there's more negative than there is positive and then a few hours later all the negative is removed yeah so that's, he, not being, that's not being authentic or you know anything and mm -mm. no and, and it's, you're getting a one-sided perception so those those are the things right there that why we're headed for a mental health crisis because you can't put this on the back burner this really needs, and it, 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 it actually infuriates me when politicians say that they're going to do this, this, and this, and all these things, when they really know they're not capable of accomplishing any of it. Yeah. Don't, like, give, don't, don't give me broken promises, because then I'm going to lose respect for you. Exactly. Like, I, I should be against term limits. I'm kind of moving the other way, because I was like, you know, there, I see what's like, you know, there's always term limits, take a vote them out, you know, but no one's voting anyone out, you know, because, you know, they no. take care, take it on people. <laughs> And I think right. another, I think another channel, another another channel, so like pose those terminals, right? And pose you you're going to be a con for eight years. I think that's going to give the lobbyists and bureaucrats even more power, right? 
Because yeah. you have people coming every eight years or every how many years it is. Four. Yeah. Oh, 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 trust me, I've been here for 30 years. Well, exactly. That's I don't trust you. You've been here for 30 years, right? <laughs> right. Well, it's your track record. What have you? This is what I ask. How have you enriched the lives of our community as a politician? That's it. That that's if you're not enriching my life and the lives of those people around me, then you're not doing your job. Yeah, I remember I had a guest on a, about a month ago, Joseph Todd. He ran for a city council, a local town. He said, I started about a, a, a guy in, in the local community. He ran for mayor. And so he's going to, he's been the, the, thing, the mayor, either mayor or councilman that said like maybe 20, 30 years, right? Always get reelected. And so he went to the Seattle Times to get like an endorsement. And mm -hmm. the Seattle Times asked you, what have you done in your time in office? And he can say he had, had nothing, he had no like nothing he could say, right? <laughs> he didn't make no impact, nothing, made nothing better. But he kept on getting reelected, yeah. right? All right. I love it. It's so funny. Yeah, that's just how it is. I mean, if I look back of what it is that I've done, you know, I know that I would say the major impact or enrichment is I've saved lives. I've given people hope, acceptance and forgiveness, you know, and that's that's really the last seven years more than ever. I, you know, I fed people, <laughs> you know, CCs, you feed a lot of people, you know, you give them value. Right. But it's kind of like, Really, what is your purpose? What is it you want to accomplish? What are your dreams, your visions, or your goals? And how can you get there? And I think a lot of politicians just, they're living, when you talk about the bubble, think about during COVID. Any governor or any mayor is probably living in a million dollar home, working from home, still receiving a paycheck. Really, the person's out here that's struggling when they close down their business and they're no longer able to work, that's making eight, 12, $14 an hour, those are the people that are really struggling and really suffering. And, and here's, here's what's going to occur now. You've lost billions of dollars in revenue over the last two years. How do you get that revenue back? Increase taxes. That's it. So property taxes are going to increase, gas taxes, sales tax. Everything that you purchase starting this year is going to increase. So not only are you going to have huge inflation prices, you're not, your dollar is going to go a lot less. And now you're going to have more stress and more anxiety, right? Plus of wearing the mask plus of everything else that's going on. Plus so many people are, are just truly, truly, so many people are so scared of dying of COVID. And, yeah. and fear and anxiety weaken your immune system. So now you have all this fear, all this anxiety. Now your immune system is weaker than it ever was before because of it. So it's this negative ripple effect that we need, we need politicians that give us all the options that this vaccine isn't the only remedy and the only option. Here are all the lists of options for you to have a healthy, holistic lifestyle and to be independent and not be codependent. I feel that a lot of people that have become codependent on one level become codependent on other levels, mentally, physically, spiritually, and financially. They find that codependency on all aspects of their lives. And we need to, we need to have a community full of warriors, a community full of heroes that are empowered, that we empower one another and yeah, we understand. There's a stat out there that says, like, you know, since COVID started, I think 75% of, of white collar workers work remotely, but only 15% of blue collar workers work, work remotely, right? So the people yeah. like white collar really, really like, you know, so like the kind of well off middle class jobs, software developers, mm -hmm. accountants, HR, you know, they're not really at risk of COVID because they, they can stay home work, but like, you know, like the plumbers, you know, you can't, if you're a plumber, you can't channel somebody's pipe from home, right? <laughs> you know, plumbers, <laughs> all these people, you know, I mean, they get paid good money too, but you know, yes. they're at more risk of COVID. I think it puts even more stress on, on, on the specific, specific demographic of the population. Right. Well, 38 million people quit their jobs last year in America. 45% of America is employed. So that means 55% are unemployed or retired or living on social security or whatever it is. But you only have 45% of America employed right now. And then you had 38 million people that quit their jobs last year. So we're, we're in a very, you know, not, not to get too off into the realm of politics, but we're in a very unique situation right now, because you got to think of every major city, there's a Democrat run governor, and you have the highest crime, you have the highest drug use, you have the highest homeless, but you also have the highest income and the highest property values, <laughs> right? So it's like, you've got to have this balance of, hey, I live in the city. And here's all the pros, but here's also all the cons at once. And it's we're in a very, very, very unique place in history right now. I, I believe from my personal space that 
this year, you're going to see even a more influx of people relocating to areas that resonate with them more than ever. They're going to move out of the areas that no longer resonate with them, and they're going to move to areas that do because they're not working. And they really can make that choice to move wherever they want to in the country. Right. And a lot of people work from home. Um, so I think this is going to be the year more than ever that you're going to see a whole relocation, especially before. I mean, interest rates to me are super low compared to the 80s. They're at 3.5 percent for homes. Um, but I think you're going to see more of an influx of people. And, and I to me personally, I think they're going to move to places that are like Colorado or places maybe like Washington or places that or even more rural. So they're gonna move out of the city, like out of Denver and move more rural or Kansas City more rural or Seattle. You know, they're gonna go more rural because they're gonna, there's a thing that we feel. When we go into nature, we feel more connected, right? We feel better about who we are. And we don't always understand why, but I think that's one of the reasons that draws people further into nature is because even though they don't wanna admit it, it's, it's healthier for them. But that's just my theory. We'll know, we'll know at the end of the year what happens, how many more people relocate, but. I think this is going to be a year where a lot of things change economically, and I think they're going to move to where it serves them. Yeah, I, I think Seattle is a perfect example you're talking about, right? Because you know, Seattle, Seattle puts the capital L on liberal, the P, capital mm -hmm. P, and progressive right. There's yeah. a lot of like homelessness, a lot of problems. But then again, you have like Amazon, Microsoft, yeah. Boeing, Starbucks, Expedia, yep. and like yeah. it's a vibrant startup community, a lot of venture capital money. So it's a vibrant community, right? However, come all, this, all the problems still going on, right? I think yeah. communities are going to be like that. Yeah. So they've got to figure out what is it, you know, because a lot of times you think it's short lived and a lot of times you can, people are okay with it. The people that are really okay with it will stay there. The people that are not are going to be the ones that, that relocate, you know, and, 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 and maybe a lot of people that have lived downtown. I know when Denver, this whole thing with COVID started with Denver, the, the apartments and duplexes and everything that were downtown were empty. It was the first time ever that more people were moving out of the downtown metro area. Yeah. Yeah. Seattle was the same way, the mm -hmm. same way last year. Yeah, I don't know where they're at today. I haven't, I haven't researched it, but I just that's kind of my theory is that you're going to see a little the most shift that you've probably seen in a long time of people relocating this year. Um, they're just going to be tired and fed up, or they want to be in that area. You know. Okay. I mean, yeah. Go ahead. Um, Give us your definition of community. Mm. Oh, so community to me is family, friends, or anybody that you have a connection with. And now that doesn't that doesn't have to be somebody in your neighborhood, but our, my community expands because of, of, you know, I own property in, in Missouri, Oklahoma, and Colorado. So directly, my that is my community. My community is Warriors Ascent, our veterans, essential personnel. My, my community is anybody that has had depression, anxiety, PTSD, anybody that's been a drug or alcoholic, anybody that's been abused, anybody that served in the military or thought about it or a family member. To me, that's community. That it's this broad, if I could throw my net out there, right? From, from Seattle out to Bainbridge Island, <laughs> right? And, and even further, you know, or go down to Oregon, like all over, even India. I still have friends in India and Canada. That is my community. You know, uh, I, I think a lot of people, their community is different. Now, my friends, you know, I have a very few select friends, but that's definitely my community. So, Kerry, do you have any friends or family members that don't get what you do? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you explain to them what you do? Uh, you know, my family definitely gets it, right? And a lot of my family is super proud of what I've done. And a lot of my friends are that way as well. I think a lot of it is like that voodoo, like they get confused, right? They're they just like a lot of people think. <laughs> you know this New Orleans voodoo, Louisiana stuff, right? <laughs> right. They're like, what is he? What kind of voodoo stuffs he got going on, right? Uh, or they call it the hippy dippy, right? Yeah, that's it too. The hippy dippy, yeah, that phrase, mm -hmm. yeah. They they all want to know like what religion I am, and and that's a you know, a, a topic that I don't get into a lot of times because I don't want to steer people to a certain religion. I want to steer people to their own spirituality. Um, so I think some people, a lot of people are, are, a lot of my family is more appreciative than others. Um, I think you always, the feedback I got last year, like, so I started doing a, a, a community text. I have a community number. And with that community number, I send out a daily 
sometimes inspirational, thought-provoking text message, right? And some of these guys are like, man, that's that's some voodoo Star <laughs> Wars. You know, I, I've been thinking about that question all day and I can't answer it, man. I can't I can't even focus on work or nothing, but I, I need you to answer it for me. <laughs> right. Uh, but I would say overall, most of the people get it. I think um, some people like I got a, I got three or four, maybe five responses last year of people that I've known since high school or right after high school of how much they've seen grow change enlightenment in me and how they haven't changed at all since high school how they haven't got more knowledge or a lot more knowledge to the level in this in the same capacity that I have had which is really inspirational I'm not you know and I realize we all change we all transform at different levels but I think you know that that was motivating to me and that's exciting and so i think most people i don't get criticism i I do at the first time in warrior's descent like there was this i'll never forget this black police officer i mean his arms were as big as my legs and and i come in with my long hair my incense and everything he's like what's your story and then like wednesday he comes up and he hugs me he's like dude i love you so much and he's like here's my phone number if you're ever in a situation where you need help In South Kansas City, I'm always patrolling that area. So a lot of times it's that first, once again, we're judging on the looks, the appearance of who's this hippy dippy guy with the long hair coming in barefoot, or maybe my toes are painted, don't get it. But then after they understand and realize, hey, this guy's genuine, this story, this this transformation works, I feel better about who I am, get it. So I, I haven't got criticism from my family or my friends. I always get uh, acceptance and they're always very supportive. So Carrie, let's say someone comes to you and they're filled with hate, filled with anger, filled with depression, filled with negativity. How do you help them get to a better, pro- a better place? What's your process for that? Yeah, so it's not instantaneous. The first thing is just to, to, once again, let that person know that I love and accept them for who they are today. That there's no judgment, there's no criticism. And there's no expectations, right? We're, we're in a safe space. We're in a space where you can be vulnerable, raw, and authentic. Uh, with any client that comes to me, not in the Warriors Ascent realm, but any client, if you came to me, the first thing we're going to focus on is your mission statement. What excites you? What gets you up in the morning? What motivates you? Because we've got to find that self-motivation. And then we've got to start working on gratitude. So then I will ask a series of questions like, you know, what is it you're great? What, where do you find gratitude? Where do you find thankfulness? Where do you disconnect? Where do you feel whole and complete? Where can you go to release? And so we start focusing on the good aspects of those things. And then I always encourage, so if you go to my training, you're going to get a journal. It's an AM and PM self-care journal. So then we start focusing on self-care and we start focusing on hope and love and acceptance and how we find that in your life. So it's not, a, not, it's not anything that can be done normally in five minutes. It, sometimes it takes five days or five weeks for people to transform. I will tell you overall, statistically, after people go through Warriors Ascent, the majority of the people really feel a difference in 12 to 18 months after they're practicing mindfulness and meditation and journaling each and every day. The days they don't do it and the weeks they start falling off, their stress, their anxiety, everything, depression goes up and then they come back down. So giving people a sense of purpose of what gives them hope, you know, and they've got to be willingness. You know, not everybody wants to work with me because I will hold you accountable. You know, I had a, had a client recently tell me he's not an alcoholic. He just drinks every day for the fun of it. And I said, well, we talk once a week. So here's what's going to happen is I'm going to check in with you from a week from now and that you haven't drank for the entire seven days. So next Friday, we're gonna talk and uh, I wanna know what your experience is and how connected you feel and how much closer you feel to your kids and your wife without drinking. So I sent him a text on Friday, I said, hey, I'm still in Kansas City, Warriors Descent, but we can connect in a few days. I've never heard from the guy, right? And I'm okay with that because it's like when you're ready to really change and transform and be okay with who you are, that's it. So. If somebody comes to me that's anger, that's bitter, you know, a lot of times it's a self-reflection. A lot of times it's it's things that have happened in their life or they're in a very toxic relationship with themselves. And then they turn that into others. Um, And so that's what we start off. 
first thing, first thing is going to be your mission statement. What drives you? What motivates you? What excites you? What's, what gets you up in the morning? And then where do you find the positive things in your life? Genetically, unfortunately, and fortunately from our parents, we have a 50-50 shot of where we're going to be happy or not. So if both your parents, you know, if you look at your parents and they were both pessimistic, then you're probably pessimistic. But if both of them were optimistic, then you're going to be optimistic, you know, and then the other 40 percent is things that we can change and 10 percent is like life experiences. So how you begin to enjoy your life, live your life is really an opportunity to transform your life and find joy and happiness. Okay, so for the people you help out and are, are, are doing this stuff for, do they have 24 seven access to you or do you have your own boundaries set up? Well, so here's how I explain it to them is there's, I definitely have healthy boundaries, but I do tell them I live in the Rocky Mountains. So I don't always get cell service. If I'm at home, I'm gonna get cell service. But if I'm out on a hike or I'm out somewhere, I may not get cell service. So I say, hey, if you need to get a hold of me, make sure you leave a voicemail because I may not even get the missed call. My wife calls me, friends call me. Hey, I called you. I'm like, I don't have a missed call, right? So I'm in a spot where cell service is intermittent. They definitely have access because I need to be there for those people 24 seven. Now, if I feel like I need to disconnect, I will turn my phone off in the evenings. If I feel like I need to be there for people, I will leave my phone off or you know leave it on. So they definitely have access to me because I want to be there. If anybody calls me like, hey, I'm suicidal or I'm depressed or I'm anxious or I just, I need to vent, I want to be, be available. So the majority of the time I'm available to pick up my phone. And I'll be there for them unless I have, you know, other clients or calls or, you know, self-care regimen. During my self-care regimen, I, I turn my phone on silent. So the thing is about my phone, I have no not notifications turned on except for if you call me. That's it. Now, I have a separate old phone that has social media on it. So it has the TikTok and the Instagram and the Facebook, and that has no notifications. So my phone has no notifications unless you're going to call me. And, and I'm disconnected from technology. So if it's during my self-care time, I don't care who you are. You could be the president. I'm not going to pick up. Nice. That's yeah, my, it, it, that's my time. Boundaries. Yeah, that's my time. Yeah. Can you tell us about your weekly uh, unscripted, I think it's a, a Sunday video calls that you're doing or videos you're doing on Sundays? Yeah, I just, I, I thought about it a couple of years ago and I, I just really got motivated and I talked to my wife about it because my schedule is so crazy. And I said, you know, when, when is the only time I'm available and, it, and it's crazy because like I drive normally to Kansas City on a Sunday to do a retreat. So, you know, I'm going to have to pick a spot that I actually have good Wi-Fi for that hour, hour and a half. But it's an opportunity for to, to connect with the community, you know. Um, and once again, it's kind of serendipitous that the people that happen to join on that week, it's not always the same people. You know, there's a few that are, that are the same that, you know. Or die hard, but a lot of times it's people that are struggling and going through the same thing of, you know, either obesity or it's it's diet or something with a spouse or a child. Um, but we just get on there and we just chit chat like we do now. You know, I just we do a check in with everybody, see where everybody lives. You know, um, just a friendly reminder sometimes where we met, and we just talk about the things that are going on in their life, and provide a path of love and acceptance, a path that's not you know, I would say unscripted, but not, not restricted. We can talk about anything you want and we're going to, you know, and the, it's always nice because the other people on the call also provide really great sound advice to whoever's struggling. Um, so it's open to anybody, you know, anything you want to talk about, you know, we, I think a couple of weeks ago, we talked about finances and we, we talked, gave a couple of, uh, you know, methods to budgeting and what we can do to budget, you know? So, it, it'll be different every week, <laughs> you know, somebody may want to talk about, you know, sunsets or sunrises or paintings or whatever, you know, you never know where the, where the interests and the topics go. Kerry, can you talk about how you, you're utilizing social media to, to expand your message and specifically yeah. your, your YouTube channel? Yeah. So to me, that's, it's really spontaneous and it's when I can be more authentic and real. It's not like, Oh, I've got a, I, I don't have myself put up a video every single Friday at noon or Sunday or whatever it is. It's like, this is what's really been on my heart. This is what people have been talking to me about. And when they come and talk to me, I feel like I need to share this message. A lot of times it's a question. So like Jason, if you had a specific question and you text me like, hey, I wanna know about 
whatever, healthy boundaries, or I want to know about yoga. Well, I can't type that out, man. There's no way. So a lot of times these short, you know, two, even sometimes one minute, one to five, 10, 15 minute videos. A lot of those are questions that people have asked me personally. And for me to answer it, it's easier for me to put it out on a YouTube video because normally there's more than one people that have that. So from my community, a lot of those videos, the majority of them have come from that. Now, like the self-care, you know, I did like 30 days of self-care options or 30 days of yoga. Those are things that just allow people to, to think about, hey, 30 days of self-care. What are 30 days, 30 things I can do differently over the next day or 30 different types of yoga. But a lot of them are just questions people have asked me. And I've just provided that path. And that, that's a way for me to connect with my community. And the text is the motivator text. That's something you send out every day. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so those, that's something you come up with. Are those, are those your own motivation quotes? Are you, are you using someone else's quotes? Or is it a combination? So a lot of it is uh, sometimes I get inspiration. So like uh, it could be from a movie. It could be from like an NPR interview. It could be from something that I read. But I, I usually take that and formulate it into something that resonates with me. So I'll change the verbiage you know, a little bit, uh, because even though like you're telling me something, I hear it differently. So I don't have my wallet with me, but I have a wallet with a, a journal. So even if I'm like driving down the road or something, I'll pull over and write down my quote. Uh, so I have about 400 of them. I started this last summer, just writing down things every day. So like today's, today's quote was food is information, not calories. Now I've heard that from a lot of different people, right? A lot of people have said that. But I, also I put in there that elevated blood sugar affects the amygdala and the hippocampus, which in turn affects learning, memory, and cognition. So that's just something that I've done out of my research. So the food that we eat, it's information, and it can also affect our cognitive ability to learn, to share, to do everything that we do. So food plays a vital role. So those messages um, sometimes are just thoughts that I've come up with, you know, um, and sometimes there are things from other interactions, could be anything, a movie, a song, a book, NPR, whatever it is, you know, and it, it's taking part of that and placing in it to where it resonates within my life. Carrie, is there anything I sort of asked you that didn't or anything else you want to talk about? I would say that, you know, if anybody's ever struggling or anybody needs anything, feel free to call me, text me. You know, my, my phone number is 816-313. 2013 and that's available to you if if you know anybody that's been a veteran or wants to have a whole entire week of healing that's a department of correction or essential personnel go to warriors ascent i can promise you you will get something out of that program everybody has gotten something out of that program so you don't have to be like in a very bad toxic state you can be in an okay state or you're on your path to healing but this will really amplify it and make it a lot better and then if there's anything that I can do for anybody that's listening at any level, feel free to reach out to me anytime. So I just, I want the community to know that they are loved and accepted, that they're not judged, that they're not criticized, that there, there doesn't have to be the social comparison that you're comparing yourself to who you were or who you might be, or the social comparison as you get on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, that you feel like your life isn't enough because you are more than enough and that you are truly loved and accepted and that there's hope that you can find hope. You can find forgiveness. You can find trust. All of that is capable that, you know, one of the things I talk to a lot of people is they feel like they have to be in debt the rest of their life. I'll, I'm always going to have a car payment. I'm always going to have a house payment. I'm always going to have student loans. And you don't have to have any of those. You don't have to have a conventional life to be happy. You can go like my wife and I live in a van for six months without anything and, and enjoy life and live life and have that unconventional life. And just you know, one thing I want to encourage is people that really begin to focus on self-care and that self-care isn't selfish and to spend at least an hour alone with yourself and whatever that means each and every day. So. Carrie, can you share your social media links so people can reach out to you? I'm going to say the easiest thing is if you just uh, search my name. So it's K-E-R-R-Y. Last name is S-T-E-U-A-R-T. And if you search for Carrie Stewart, you'll find me on LinkedIn, you'll find me on Twitter, you'll find me on Instagram, you'll find me on Facebook, and you'll find me on YouTube. And so if any of those platforms resonate with you, 
you know, just search Carrie Stewart, K-E-R-R-Y-S-T-E-U-A-R-T. And to our listener, we'll have his phone number and all the social media links in the show notes. You find our show yep. notes at www.cavernstatechoblaw.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends and network and be sure to subscribe to the Jason Cabinet Experience. Carrie, so we come to the end of a talk. You had any uh, last minute wisdom or advice or any subject you want to talk about? Uh, I would just say, man, I just, I, once again, I love you guys. I, I love and accept you guys for who you are today. And I want you to begin to feel that. I want you to begin to feel excited and really think about transforming from the role of a victim. I'm not talking, I'm talking victimhood. We've all been victims, but into that warrior where you're forging your own path, you're choosing your own destiny and you're finding that community and that society that you really appreciate, respects and loves you. We only have one life to live. And that this year, I really want you to find joy, peace, acceptance, unconditional love and hope for all mankind. Jason, thank you so much for this opportunity, brother. I appreciate it. No, thank you, Kerry. Thank you for being here, for being a guest. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.